All right, so I'm missing my trusty cohort in our podcast, Dennis, so I have to play his part, which means the intro, which is you are now watching or listening to the James Grage Theory, episode number 30, and I'm here with special guest. Actually, we're here in your home turf, here in your office, Dr. Brett Osborne. We're in Jupiter, Florida. Brett, you and I go back years now. Uh, you have been... BPI's resident keto expert here. If you could, just a, a little bit of a background of uh, your interest and expertise in keto, but also what you do outside of that. By trade, I'm a neurosurgeon, as you know. Um, I was trained at, um, at New York University. My neurosurgical practice is exclusively neurosurgical trauma. I work at a le local level one trauma center, gunshot wounds, um, spine trauma, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the majority of my time uh, spent in the office here is um, under the guise of age management. And one of the things that we push very, very heavily in my clinic is not so much the ketogenic diet, but the, and we'll talk about this, I guess, um, but the modified ketogenic diet. So it's uh, based upon a, a low carbohydrate, um, relatively low carbohydrate scheme, not as low as the classic ketogenic or Atkins diet that everybody um, uh, associates that word keto right. with. And ketosis is just uh, distilled down a very, very uh, accelerated burning of fat. You don't so, have to go so, into the biochemistry so, of it. But so, so that is, a, that, that, and that's one of the popular questions here. And so a lot of the questions, things that I want to talk to you today about are questions that people have, basic questions. And so what is, so a traditional, because you and I have talked about modified ketogenic diets or different variations of it, but so what is the definition of a traditional keto diet? Right. So the, the traditional ketogenic diet, and this is, this is rough, but typically uh, one is maintaining a daily carbohydrate load of less than 25 grams or 5%, if you will, of their daily carbohydrate load is derived from carbohydrates. And those should be low glycemic index carbohydrates. So my cutoff in my clinic is, is 40, but I use modified ketogenic diet, so it's a little bit higher as far as carbohydrates. So traditional under 25 grams under or 5% or, of your total. Or 5%, right? And it's not a high-protein diet as is commonly perceived. It's a high-fat diet. Well, those who use ketogenic diets, you're talking about 70% or so of daily, of daily caloric requirements are derived from fat. So between that and the carbohydrates, 75% of your calories, and then the other 20 or 25% is... Uh, derived from protein. So it is certainly not a high protein diet. And the reason, I, the genesis of that is that you see people on an Atkins diet and all they're doing is eat meat. Oh, it must be a high protein diet. No, that's not true. It's really a high fat diet. What you don't see them eating is the creams and the butters and the, the whipped cream um, and the olive oil um, and the avocados, all the rest of the things that really are the mainstay of these diets. Those are predominantly fats, as you know. So you don't want to eat too much protein on a ketogenic diet, right. it's going to knock you out of ketosis. So one of my definitions, the, the difference between a low carbohydrate diet and a ketogenic diet is ketosis. So traditionally in low carb diets, people weren't chasing ketosis. Now, how important in your opinion, in a traditional diet is ketosis for weight loss? Because when I look at it, someone asked me says, well, what's the difference when it comes specifically only to weight loss following a low carb diet? versus a ketogenic diet. I think a lot of people believe ketosis is some sort of magical state where there's like rainbows and pixies and, you know, it's not magic. I think that being in ketosis or using exogenous sources of ketones like BHB make being in a low carb state more tolerable to do that over a period of time because anyone who's done low carb knows what it feels like when you're on low carb. Sure. You're, you're tired, you feel mentally foggy, you feel like you just can't, you know, sure. think clearly. So I believe being, you know, being able to use ketones as a source of fuel for your brain sure. makes it more tolerable, but from a weight loss perspective, so taking tolerable out of the equation from, you know, apples to apples and weight loss, low carb versus key, you know, ketosis, any difference? No. Um, the only difference, and this would have to be measured over long periods of time, would be the um, rapidity of an individual's fat loss. But I will tell you that on the protocol that we use here, again, 50, 75, 100 grams, you're not in ketosis. If you were to take a look at it on a stick, right, right or even take your blood, right, you're going to be right at 
probably 0.4 or 0.5 millimolars. So for those individuals that are listening or watching, that would mean you may be pink on the strip, which as you know is the very, very edge. Right. Okay? You may not be spilling ketones. You may not. Now, you could spill ketones if you were to take a look at your, if you were to do a urine uh, dipsticks, right after you trained intensely, as you right. know, then you're probably going to be pushed into, particularly if you train on a fast. But you know what? During the day, no, you're not going to be. And, and it's, it's, these are, it's, it's, you're splitting hairs. I, I think the, the misconception is that if you're not in ketosis, that you're not burning fat as a source of fuel. And, and that's the part where I think there's a lot of confusion out there thinking that the state of ketosis is what's burning fat. It's being in a low carb state where you're now training your body to utilize fat as a source of fuel. And the ketosis only makes it more, like I said, more tolerable, where now your body has made that transition. It's turning triglycerides into ketones for your body to use as a source of fuel. Right. Um, or, or, is, or am I off on that? No, it, it has to do with the only difference between being on, on a, a, in a low carbohydrate protocol, just to say a modified ketogenic diet um, or a ketogenic diet, is the rapidity of fat loss of lipolysis, which eventually um, overloads the liver's ability to process these molecules, if you will, and then you start forming ketones. That's just a very, very 30,000, that's a 30,000 foot view of what's going on. You are going to be burning fat if you live in a low insulin state, independent of whether or not you're in ketosis. Ketosis is a, it's just the very, very rapid, it's the extreme lipolytic state of the body but it has nothing to do with you being in lipolysis. You, right. are in, you are burning fat predominantly, just like my patients, just like my patients, um, except they're not in ketosis. They are not in ketosis, but they are burning fat. Okay, so the two are, one, it, it, this, is on a, this is on a spectrum. Right. That's all it is. When you eat no carbohydrates, a very, very low carbohydrate, your body is going to be reliant uh, on liver glycogen, not muscle glycogen, but really liver glycogen. And ultimately what's going to end up happening, this is why it takes a couple of days to get in, is you're going to de deplete it down, yep. right? And when you deplete it down, that's the signal for, uh-oh, now we have to start forming these, this alternate energy source, which is called ketone. I've always thought of ketosis as almost like a backup energy system for the body. If, if, if your body is not able to get any sources of glucose, that this is one alternate way for your body to power your brain. Um, it is an alternate energy source. That's 100% what it is. And that's the reason why from an evolutionary standpoint, we have evolved um, to uh, generate ketones. The brain loves glucose. Right. It loves glucose. Um, but the skeletal muscle, um, in addition to loving glucose, it can also use ketones, as can the heart. Right? All of these other um, organs um, can use it. Um, so it is just that it's an alternate energy source. And now we have obviously the ability to access that, um, through, through supplements. Some people actually say that ketones are going to be the, the fourth macronutrient, which right. is an interesting concept. It is. It is an interesting concept. So, and I, again, I, going back to this confusion out there, I think that a lot of people believe that unless they're in ketosis, they're not going to burn fat as fuel. So that's the first thing. I think we need to separate that and say, okay, when you're in this low carb state, when you're eliminating the carbohydrates from your diet, and now you're training your body to utilize fat as a source of fuel, that's where weight loss comes from, not from ketosis. Correct. So ketosis, when you're in this low carb state, you're not getting a source of, of glucose from dietary carbohydrates. I think another source of confusion is that now your body is completely free, no longer reliant on glucose. And that's another misconception. So let's talk about that because, you know, in the world of bodybuilding, you'd call that being catabolic, right? Where your body starts to actually break down stored muscle or even dietary sources of protein and turning that into glucose. So can we talk about that just for a second? Because I think that's one thing people think, oh, well, now my brain is just running 100% off of ketones and that's not true. Uh, that's right. And your body, uh, even if you were to starve yourself, um, your brain is always going to be supplied with um, glucose. There's no question. It will, ultimately, you will sacrifice um, muscle um, to uh, feed the brain right. okay, through uh, processes, as you know, called gluconeogenesis, et cetera, et cetera, despite the fact that all liver glycogen is, is depleted, so it's not coming from the, from the liver. You are going to ultimately sacrifice um, a muscle in the 
starved state. But what's interesting is that I'm sure you know, um, ketones, even oral ketones, uh, so beta hydroxybutyrate um, has muscle sparing effects, which is why even though people are in a massively catabolic fat burning state when they are in ketosis, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, there's still a preservation of muscle. Okay, so, so which is one of the benefits of using oral ketones. However, I will tell you, that one of the reasons why we don't in my clinic use um, a classic ketogenic diet is because I don't want people losing any muscle. I want people putting on muscle. Right. So there's a difference. And if you were to ask me why, in addition to when we spoke about this before, it's hard to be long-term on a ketogenic diet. So in addition to the traditional t- strict yes, a, ketogenic. A traditional, um, it's difficult. Um, you get tired of the food, et cetera. And there's a lot of reasons why. So that's why at the, at the end of this conversation, I want to cover some other topics. I definitely want to come back around and talk about different variations of a ketogenic diet and who that fits, because I don't, I don't believe that any diet or any nutrition strategy is a one size fits all. And I think it really depends on who you are. I think it depends on what your fitness goals are or your, or your weight loss goals and maybe how that relates to what your other goals are. Are you a bodybuilder? You want to maintain lean muscle? Are you trying to put on muscle? So I I do want to come back around at the end and talk about some of those things. First, I want to talk about some of the misconceptions or maybe you think some of these things are true. Let's talk about first in a traditional, the extreme ketogenic diet, health issues. So there's a lot of, if you go on Google and you look at, you know, ketogenic diets, you're going to hear a lot of people talking about potential liver damage that happens in a long-term ketogenic state. So let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. Um, There are these um, rare cases of people developing um, issues with their liver, um, pancreatitis, et cetera, et cetera, from the uh, markedly, um, markedly elevated uh, dietary fats that are consumed during a ketogenic diet. But I will tell you that these are uh, rare complications. I also get questions um, on social media, et cetera, et cetera, via emails about uh, people um, that have had cholecystectomy, so their gallbladder's taken out. Right. Um, and um, ketogenic diets, classically traditional ketogenic and, and, diets. And explain to people real quick uh, that don't know what the function of the gallbladder is so they understand the correlation between that and a high fat diet. Right. So the gallbladder, or, or bile, I should say, bile is um, in addition to. Um, the pancreas, uh, those organs, one of their many functions is to process, break down, if you will, um, dietary fats. If you don't have, obviously, if you don't have a pancreas, you have to supplement with, um, with uh, or if you've had pancreatitis, you're going to have an issue uh, processing dietary fats, digesting dietary fats, and the same thing if you don't have um, uh, your liver. But by no means does that mean you can't be on a ketogenic diet. So my typical response is, look, just go and get some digestive enzymes. And typically, they're very, very, it's very, very well tolerated thereafter. So I always recommend 15 minutes before your meal, take some digestive enzymes and split up your dietary fat. So if you're having 100 grams of fat a day, right. split it up into five meals. So most of the health concerns that people are talking about are related just to the fact that it's a high, high intake of fat. That's correct. correct. So how does then, let's then talk about, because there's good fats and there's bad fats. And I think that's another misconception with the ketogenic diet. Hey, great. I can just go eat whatever fats that I want. It's a high fat diet. So just from a health perspective first, let's not even talk about weight loss, but let's then transition into weight loss. But since we're talking about health, let's talk about the difference then between consuming a lot of, you know, healthy fats versus what you would consider bad fats and then the associated risk. Right. So typically, as you you know, your observations have been my observations. You know, you see these people on the Atkins diet and they're eating 14 cheeseburgers a day. That ultimately ends up stopping, by the way, um, because, as you know, ketones, there's a feedback loop and ketones, they send a satiety signal to the brain. OK, so you end up talking to somebody and says, oh, I'm on this new diet. It's this Atkins diet, um, and I'm having six bacon double cheeseburgers a day, no bread. Then you talk to them in six weeks, and you go, how the bacon double cheeseburgers? They go, "Mm, I sort of don't want that anymore, right? And the reason why that happens, and I have this conversation with my patients continually, um, twice today already, um, is that in addition to the the ketones sending um, a satiety signal to the brain, what ends up- Explain that so people understand that. Oh, it shuts down, it shuts down, um, there's an area of the brain called the hypothalamus and it will literally temper 
your hunger. There's a satiety signal there. There's a satiety center there where if you were to, to stimulate it, right, your hunger is going to go down. There's also a, an eat uh, center in the hypothalamus where if yeah. you stimulate it, you'd be ravenous. Okay. So it does send a satiety signal, um, the presence of these ketones, which is why if you use oral ketones, you'll notice that you're, you've tempered your hunger. If your body has been conditioned by virtue of a traditional ketogenic diet, a modified ketogenic diet, if you are living in a low insulin state and you are preferentially burning fat as opposed to sugar, carbohydrate, there's really no motivation for you to eat anymore, right? So like I always tell my patients, you're not addicted to the line of cocaine in the refrigerator at 10 o'clock at night. Why? Because despite how lean you are, you're a lean guy. I'm a lean guy, right? You got about 100,000 calories of fat underneath your skin. You do too. Mm -hmm. So if your body is used to using that, it's not chasing after the line of cocaine in the refrigerator at 10 right. o'clock at night because it's just chasing after it here. So you're, gonna not be, you're not going to need to eat all of this fat any longer, any food. Your, your hunger is going to go down. All right, your appetite's going to go down, which is one of the problems with the ketogenic diet, in, in my opinion, one of the things that I have to coax my patients into, I have to push them to eat. Why do I push them to eat? Because I want them not to shed any muscle. So, so, so here's an interesting thing, because if you look at it and you'd say, okay, here, the basic concept of a ketogenic diet or a low-carb diet is to go ahead and burn fat as a source of fuel. Now, so ideally, we all have, like you said, an excess amount of stored body fat, even the leanest of people. So... If we're looking at one hand, dietary sources of fat, right? We're, we're making this transition now, trying to teach our body to burn fat as fuel. What does that transition look like of going and consuming a lot of dietary fats to train our body to burn fat as fuel? And at some point making this transition where, to your point, we're not eating as much as we were before because we're trying to get our body to preferentially burn stored body fat as, as a source of fuel versus dietary fat. So what does that balance look like? And is there some sort of transition where, because you still want the calories, because to your point, you don't want to lose the lean muscle. Lean muscle is our metabolic engine. So what is that? Is there a shift? Is there something where at a certain point people make this transition? What we see um, in our clinic, and actually, let me answer real quickly, okay, in two sentences about the, the inflammatory fats versus the anti-inflammatory fats. In my clinic and in a, tra in a traditional ketogenic diet, despite the fact that people are typically eating bacon, you know, bacon double cheeseburgers and things like that, that is not what you should be doing. Right. Because in spite of the weight loss, you will lose weight. You will lose body fat, okay, and some muscle, but you'll lose body fat. And you'll have a very, very nice um, aesthetic appearance. If you look at your uh, inflammatory markers, they'll all be through the roof. And we do see that in some of our aggressive red meat eaters. So I don't want you getting your dietary fat from red meats because that is inflammatory fat. I wanted olive oil, coconut oil, avocados, nuts, et cetera, et cetera. That was the, that was the previous that was, question. That was the original I just question. Wanted to, I just wanted to make sure. So there is, sure, um, you will notice that your lipid profile improves even if you're eating bacon cheeseburgers. I will tell you, your lipid profile will improve. However, if you look under the hood, and you look at things like CRP and IL-6, okay, tumor necrosis factors, so TNF-alpha, things like that. Some of these more esoteric inflammatory markers, they'll all be up. So you have to be careful. And then I'll answer so, your so, next question. So, so going back to that, so we can wrap that one up, which is the health concerns. So a lot of the typical health concerns that people have when they're out there Googling and saying, you know, it's bad for your liver or it's bad for your gallbladder, eating the right types of fats, the way that you follow a ketogenic diet, is important for eliminating some of those health concerns. That is absolutely correct. Um, I understand where people are saying, I understand the genesis of these comments, but the thing about it is that if you, if you do it correctly, it's an anti-inflammatory diet. It's a low glycemic index, anti-inflammatory, low carbohydrate diet, which theoretically reduces the incidence of all these diseases. And I always say that all these diseases are the same. You can call them cancer, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative diseases. And there's plenty of data out there uh, that the oral ketone products, um, the beta-hydroxybutyrate products, um, the MC2 oil-based products, those are going to be protective of these diseases. They are. And the big one is neurodegenerative disease. We know that for a fact already. We know that for a fact. Um, there's data on um, the ketogenic diet and Alzheimer's disease. So, so you're saying a lot of the neurological diseases that following a ketogenic diet or a modified ketogenic diet can help, maybe not prevent, but slow down some of these aging processes that ultimately lead to these diseases. Yep. And there's plenty of data on it.
it's there. With regard to that other question about the transition, what we see in my practice here, and again, we're not on a, on a ketogenic diet, we're on a modified ketogenic diet, um, we do see um, over the, you know, the usual, over the first sort of, it can be three days, it can be out to 10 days, maybe there's this, there's this switch where people are a bit uncomfortable. That's the body starting to switch from predominantly a carbohydrate source of energy mm -hmm. to a, and we've talked about this before, to a predominantly fat um, source of energy. And then I usually tell patients it takes about six to 12 weeks and people call it, you know, I'm not going to use the word keto adapted because we're not keto adapted in my practice, but I call it metabolic momentum. So when you have metabolic momentum, your body is preferentially using fat, uh, as a, as a fuel source. And then your metabolism becomes bulletproof. So if you were to have a cheat meal, as an example, it's not going to derail the system. One of the reasons why people fail to get themselves um, either into nutritional ketosis or even to succeed on my plan is because when they come back to the office and they say, ah, you know, it, it hasn't worked as well as I thought. And I say, well, tell me about your diet. Well, you know, uh, I eat for three days really, really well. And then for one day I have garbage because I'm trying to reward myself. I always tell them, no, no, you can't do that. You owe me, you owe yourself a minimum of six and maybe even out to 12 weeks in order to develop that metabolic momentum where you are enzymatically fit to preferentially burn fat as fuel. I didn't say anything about ketosis. Right. You need to be in that low insulin state, never getting derailed, not for one meal, and then you will have you, that. You got sure to put noticed. the work in. You got to yes. put the work in at first to get to that point to have the luxury of being able to have a cheap meal yes. here and there. You got to put the work in for, you're saying that's probably a good 12 weeks. Yep. Yep. yep, absolutely. And then I think that your metabolism basically becomes bulletproof. And that's when you can live, and again, conversations with patients today, um, you can live lifelong, which is why I like sort of my protocol as opposed to a ketogenic diet where people get sick of it. They don't like eating, um, you know, they don't like eating in that manner. Let's just put it that way. Um, whereas if I give them a little bit more carbohydrate, they sort of can stomach it. They can have their two salads a day, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas on a classic keto, traditional ketogenic diet, a lot of times you, 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 you can't, okay? You, you, you may be one of these guys who slips out of ketosis if that's your barometer, and I don't like that barometer, who yep. slips out of ketosis if you eat, you know, two salads a day with well, this, that, I, I think that's a problem is, so right now people are conditioned, they're told that in order to be successful in a ketogenic diet, you have to be in ketosis. And so anytime you slip just a little, which I mean, for me, even if I have too much protein, if I drink a protein shake or if I drink amino acids, that alone, my body will produce enough glucose to take me out of ketosis. So if that's my barometer for success within a ketogenic diet is being in ketosis, well, then of course, I'm going to feel like I'm failing all the time and I'm going to throw my hands up and say, why am I even doing this? So yeah, I, I think in order for this to be sustainable for people to do this over a period of time and to feel successful with it, there has to be a different way of measuring success. Correct. And we use in the clinic here, we're using biochemistry. So we, we look at their inflammatory markers, we look at their fasting insulin level, we look at their hemoglobin A1C, um, amongst a, a bunch of other things. But ultimately, it's borne out on that anthropometry scale. We see it. And if you want to make it even simpler, pay no attention to the urine dipsticks and pay attention to your waistline. Right. Get rid of your scale. Just pay attention to your waistline. It's going to show up. This leads into now, we talked about in the beginning, what's the difference really between low carb diet and a ketogenic diet? And my definition is in a true ketogenic diet, your body's producing ketones and the ketones are going to help get you over the hump, give you that energy, fuel your brain. So now let's say that we're not in a full ketogenic diet. We're in a modified ketogenic diet. Our body is not producing a lot of ketones, but we're in a great fat burning state. So we're losing weight, but we don't have the ketones. Now comes exogenous sources of ketones, BHP. So let's talk about what BHP is for a second. Right. So uh, there are three types of, of ketones um, that are produced uh, in the liver after your liver glycogen is depleted in this very, very rapid overloading, if you will, fat burning state. Um, the three types are uh, acetone, um, acetoacetate, uh, and beta hydroxybutyrate. That's it. There are three. The reason why, the reason why people have that sweet smell um, on their breasts when they're on a, tra on a traditional ketogenic diet is because you're smelling the acetone. That's what it is. So before we even get into the supplements, so just so people understand, so you follow a low carb diet, you deplete your body of carbohydrates, it gets to the point, your body goes into a state of ketosis, starts turning triglycerides, fats, 
into ketones. Your body uses a source of fuel for your brain because your knee, your brain gets preferential treatment on glucose. Correct. So now it's deprived of a source of glucose. So it supplements with that, ketones. That's correct. So now going back, we're saying, hey, we're not following a true ketogenic diet or we're doing a modified ketogenic diet or, hey, we just don't want to stay in ketosis all the time. So in a ketogenic diet, your body produces three types of ketones. One of them is BHB. So now we're talking about supplementing with BHB. So let's talk. Let's go back. I, I, I derailed you a little, so let's go back to beta hydroxy and, and it doesn't matter. Again, in my practice, we use a modified ketogenic diet. If you're on a classic traditional ketogenic diet, whatever you want to call it, um, great. Um, all you are doing is um, providing your body, as I said before, with an alternate, maybe a fourth macronutrient, an alternate energy source mm -hmm. um, that potentially, no, that does, potentially has anti-cancer effects, but definitively has neuro, um, neuroprotective effects, again, in the context of Alzheimer's disease and these numerous other um, neurodegenerative uh, dementing uh, illnesses. So you are providing your body an alternate energy source. It's like instead of giving yourself, for those of you who, uh, who grew up, um, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the bodybuilding world, everybody is all about, uh, you know, Carbohydrate loading before you go to the gym. Carbohydrate loading before you go to the gym. I would argue and say, depending upon your rep range, and we've had this conversation before, and your goals, I train exclusively on a fast. So what do I use? I use best pre-workout, which has caffeine, beta-hydroxybutyrate. So you have a stimulant, caffeine, and you have an energy source okay, um, for the body. So meaning it, the BHB. Meaning the BHB. Um, and it works great. And you get used to training on a fast. It's no problem. You're a lot less sluggish than you are potentially when you eat, you know, when you Bunch eat carbohydrates. Before yeah. workout. Um, so that notion of uh, carb loading and before the marathons or before the endurance, not that I'm an endurance trainer, um, is um, it's basically bunk. I mean, it really is because particularly in those patients, uh, in those individuals, um, you're not even using those systems. You're using the Oxfos system, so you're not even using carbohydrate. We could talk about that, but I'm just saying that that, that makes zero sense. Um, we've done that for you. People have done that for eons, but it makes really no sense at all. So one thing that I tell people, but coming from you, coming from an expert, coming from a doctor, I think it it gives it a lot more credibility. One thing that I tell people, I said, look, you're, and this going, goes back to the beginning of our conversation. I said, your weight loss benefits, your fat loss benefits aren't coming from the ketones. They're coming from being a low carb state. Really, James, let me interrupt you for one second. Let's distill that down even further. It's really about the insulin signaling. I don't even care about the carbohydrates. Right. If you are in a low carbohydrate state, you are in a low insulin state. And when you're in a low insulin state, that's what's going to confer health and longevity, period. Right. These diseases are all diseases, stroke, heart attack, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease. They're all the byproduct of a high insulin state, which is an inflammatory state. You can call them whatever you want. In my mind, all of the arthritis is in there too. Call it whatever you want. All of these diseases are the same disease. So, so from a not from a health perspective, but from a body composition perspective, explain to people how insulin works and that when your insulin levels are high, what's happening. So let's say, for example, I eat a meal that's high in fat, high in dietary fat, and also high in sugar. So I get this insulin response. So explain to people what insulin actually does. Right. Um, insulin is a vascular protectant, as far as I'm concerned. High levels of insulin tell the body, bring sugar in to the cells um, and utilize it for energy. Any excess is stored as fat. Insulin's an anabolic hormone. It builds muscle and it builds fat. It yep. builds both. So we live in America, we live with high simple carbohydrate consumption, high levels of insulin, um, and by virtue of that, Anything that is excessive, so outstrips the bodily's demand for it. So if you're not running around like Michael Phelps, as an example, burning 10,000 calories a day, anything else is going to be, any excess carbohydrate is going to be stored as fat under the influence of insulin. Under the influence of insulin, excess carbohydrates are stored as fat. And that's why someone described once to me insulin simply as the storage hormone. It is a storage hormone. Okay. So signaling either like bodybuilders praise insulin for its anabolic properties right. as a, you know, just as a, a signal, right? right? Like you were saying, or on the flip side, it's also what can make us gain fat. The bottom line is that it's an anabolic hormone. It's a storage hormone, as, as James had said. The problem is, is that we are having um, 
and uh, and we here are exposed to very very heightened levels of uh, insulin excess insulin these diseases are diseases of excess in, um, uh, insulin but hang on a second it's not the insulin itself that really is the offender and James had had alluded to this before it's really the carbohydrate the excess carbohydrate simple carbohydrate consumption that does the damage so when you eat a simple carbohydrate and your sugar spikes through the roof your blood sugar if you were to test it just let's say after a meal it goes to 200 what are you doing during what is what has happened to your vascular system um, as the sugar is going north and what's happening to your vascular system and I I've scratched this wall about 10,000 times but here's what happens that's really annoying, right? And we do that, I do that because I'm showing people that sugar, um, and this again is a simplified version, is literally scratching the lining of your blood vessels. And when there's damage to the inside of the blood vessels, there's inflammation, and when there's inflammation, there's a response that's mounted, and the upshot of that response is cholesterol deposition in the lining of the arteries. And you keep eating all these sugars and sugars and have high levels of insulin to deal, to tell the body, hey, get the sugar inside the cell, clear it from the blood vessels, clear it from the blood vessels, bring it in, bring it in. Um, what ends up happening is that you overload the system. It almost becomes white noise. It's the body. It, That's exactly right. It is white noise. Now remember, when you have high levels of sugar, okay, in the blood system, in the bloodstream, because you've developed insulin resistance, not only do you have this circulating um, growth factor that's sitting there insulin it's the storage hormone it grows things not only does it grow fat what else is it growing it's growing cancers let me ask you a question when you inject you, you've heard all heard of a pet scan right so a what a pet scan it's what okay. we it's how we search for cancer in the body okay. it's a radionuclide nucleotide test okay radionuclide uh, test so it has to do with injecting a radio labeled molecule and that molecule which is radio labeled goes to the cancers. And you can find cancers. What do you think the radio-labeled molecule is that we inject? What do you think we inject? Well, glucose, right? So when you live in a low glucose state, a low insulin state, you are anti-cancering yourself. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Fat, fat, cancer cells do not use fat for energy. There's something called the Warburg effect. So, I'm sure so, you're familiar. So, so high carbohydrate diet, you're potentially feeding disease. Not potentially. You are. With 100% certainty, you are feeding disease. So if you do the opposite and you live in a low insulin state, the low carbohydrate state, I'm not saying starve yourself. Right. What's, does your body think it's starving when it's on an Atkins diet or a modified ketogenic diet? At first, yes. yeah. It, no, it always does. Because you are in a low insulin state. Right. So when, you're, when you are starved, you are in a low insulin state. Drugs like metformin. So, so does, does it always feel that way or does at some point your body adapt to it? Hold on. It doesn't feel that way, but it is that way. So in other words, you don't feel, oh my God, I'm starving. As a matter of fact, the patients on my, my modified diet, what did we say about the, about the traditional ketogenic diet? Are people starving? No. Right. Their appetite is suppressed, almost to the point where I don't like it because I have to tell them, you better eat, otherwise you are going to sacrifice some muscle. So we want to keep people in a low insulin state, but they're, they have a satiety signal. So, so let's talk about that. Let's talk, let's talk about the type of foods that people should eat. And in that, let's also have a conversation, where do carbohydrates play a role in that and what type of carbohydrates? So in a traditional ketogenic diet where we're talking about 5%, of our calories are coming from from carbohydrates mm -hmm. roughly 25 grams or less of carbohydrates sure. so let's talk about the rest we talked about briefly the types of good fats versus bad fats but let's let's talk about that let's let's actually spell it out like what are the bad sources of fats and what are some of those good sources of fat okay so again we're talking about sources of fat meaning inflammatory fats versus anti-inflammatory fat. So, so let's so break that down. Okay. Inflammatory fat. Right. So we're talking about the omega-6s, right, versus the omega-3s, really. All right. Um, and what does that mean to the average person? Right. So typically, in America, we are consuming at a ratio of 20 to 1 omega-6s versus omega-3s. So what does that mean? You're eating lots and lots of red meats, Krispy Kreme donuts. You're eating lots and lots of potato chips. These have you're eating french fries, these have dangerous levels of omega-6 fats in them. So 
and not that you can eat potato chips on an Atkins diet because you can't because they're carbohydrates. I'm just saying the types of fats that are used in the production of these things are inflammatory, right? right? But you can certainly eat red meat, right? There's no question you can eat red meat. Um, you don't want to have red meat as your source of fats day in and day out. Do you want to have bacon as your source of fats day in and day out? No, you don't. Okay? You want to have things like the good stuff, okay? So the omega-3s and the omega-9s, right? So the olive oil, the omega-3s from fish, um, the, the coconut oils, um, nuts, so almonds, walnuts, avocados, those are the good fats versus the bad fats, which is what I would just so, talk So about. let's talk about a popular trend mm-hmm. started in ketogenic diets, and that's bulletproof coffee. Now, I'm not, there's a, I believe there's a brand out there, so I'm not talking about the brand. I'm talking about the concept, which was this idea of taking a stick of butter, right. putting it in your cup of coffee, which is disgusting. Mm-hmm. Idea one, the fats would help curb your appetite, right. give you a sense of fullness. Which they do. Which they do. The caffeine obviously would curb your appetite. And a lot of the people that I heard were doing this, were doing this first thing in the morning, hence the coffee, curbing their appetite all the way until whatever, 12 o'clock or one o'clock in the afternoon. So they're not eating anything during that period of time. But also, again, the butter being a source of fat. So let's talk about that because I think that falls back in line, the difference between good fat versus bad fat. I think there's a lot of things out there that have, that are trending. And so people are saying, okay, well, hey, it's, it's okay. It's okay to eat a stick of butter. I don't think it's ever okay to eat a stick of butter. Right. So <laughs> let's let's talk about that for a second. It, it just goes back to the to the uh, to the same thing. I don't have problems with people eating small amounts of these of these things. Um, I, I I really don't. Um, one of the beneficial fats for the for the gut is something that I take. It's called butyric acid, which is um, one of the fats that's in butter. So I don't have any problem with people eating um, small amounts uh, of these, but it's all about like everything else. You can have these in moderation. And if you're going to eat these so-called bad fats, I'll make sure that if I'm going to have some red meat, I stuff, you know, three or four omega-3s, um, you know, these, these medical grade omega-3s that we use here in the office in my mouth, because it's not so much about the absolute amount of the bad fat that you eat. Um, it's, it's the ratio. A, that's it. It's the ratio. So the ideal ratio, we eat 20 to 1 here, omega, um, Americans, 20 to 1, omega-6, and inflammatory fats to anti-inflammatory fats. That's terrible. Probably should be down at 120. It's, it's hard, though. It's very, very hard. Do you need omega-6s? Maybe the other question. Well, wait a minute. Why don't we just get rid of all the omega-6s? Well, that, I, my answer to that question would be, are you going to recover from your workouts absent omega-6s? And the answer is no, because you do need the, some inflammatory mediators in the body to allow you to recover from your workout. That's an inflammatory process. And also to fight disease. Well, that's right? even when you buy a supplement, it's not just a three and nine, it's a three, six, nine. Correct. And I would also say that, you know, with the, the Japanese, it's not just that they're eating less of the inflammatory fats and more of the others. It's the, the ratio it's so eating less of those, but also eating foods higher in threes and nines, meaning fish, Etc. Hundred percent. So it's it's also what they're eating. Hundred percent. So in a keto, and let's let's we'll generalize. Just say any kind of keto diet. We want to try to minimize the animal fats. Let's again generalizing a lot of the animal sources of fats. Correct. Mm-hmm. We want to bring in sources, good sources such as olive oil or nuts, different sorts of grains, anything that are high in threes and nines. So. That's the fat aspect of it. So we want to, it's not just consume a, a diet high in fat, make sure we get good fats in there. So let's talk about the other aspect where there's a lot of confusion, especially for people working out. So that's, that's kind of my world is dealing with people that are fitness enthusiasts. They train five days a week. Most of them, even, even if they're not trying to build muscle, they're at least trying to maintain lean sure. muscle. And people have been conditioned for years and years and years, protein, 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 protein. And I do think protein is an important part of the diet, but not like it's been prioritized in years past. So let's talk about how protein plays a part in a ketogenic diet, because I've tried ketogenic diets before, and I've tried to modify them where I was bringing in. I'm used to taking a lot of amino acids. So I take a lot of BCAs. I take a lot of essential amino acids. And there's no way to be in ketosis when you're taking that much aminos through glucogenesis. Your body is converting that to glucose nonstop. So whether it's a modified keto diet or a traditional keto diet, let's talk about protein. Like what's, because I know that maintaining 
or even building lean muscle is important. Again, we talked about that. It's our metabolic engine. So I know that's a priority for you with your clients. So what is your recommendation on protein intake? Like, I guess here's a better question. No matter who you are, whether you're in keto or not, how much protein do you really need to build or maintain lean muscle? Right. Well, nobody knows the answer uh, to that, as you know. I mean, that's been a a hot topic of debate for, um, you know, for, for many years. I will tell you that. Again, um, recent literature suggests that it's overstated. Um, and I will tell you that with my own, my own body, um, I don't believe as, that I need as nearly as much as I, as I used to. I just, right. I just don't. That said, what we do, so if you're in, if you are going to follow the dipstick for whatever that's worth, mm-hmm. traditional ketogenic diet, you're going to get knocked out of ketosis real quick. Right. So if, if, if you are, like you, like you saw, if you go, um, if your ratios are, again, 70% calories from fat, uh, 5%, and then maybe uh, about 25%, or maybe even 75%, 5%, and then the other 20% from protein, if you start pushing that up, you will get knocked out of ketosis. It's going to be different for everybody. The only way to know, again, if you want to use the ridiculous dipstick as your barometer of how well you're doing, even though we know that that means very little, um, provided you're not way, way, way out of ketosis. Mm. Okay. Um, you, you have to use your dipstick and figure out where that line is for you. And it's going to be different. And I'm going to tell you that the people that are listening or watching, it's not a good idea if you want to use the uh, your ketone level it's not a good idea to use urine dipsticks because they're way off. Well, um, that, you, that's, you, that's why a product like this. You know, this one right here. So we've actually, some of the diehard uh, you know, keto people have wanted to knock this product. This is Keto Aminos, and you're familiar with this. So you've got the essential amino acids in here. So the essential nine, you've got BHB, and you've got MCT in here. Now there's other products on the market besides ours that follow a similar formula here. The concept being that, especially in your in a low carb diet, that those amino acids are helpful in preserving lean muscle mass. Sure. So, but on the flip side, if you're going to consume, whether it's essential amino acids or branch chain amino acids, are an easy available source of fuel. That there's a high likelihood that your body is going to convert those into glucose and knock you out of ketosis. So the hardcore keto people are saying, I took this product and it knocked me out of ketosis. What are your thoughts? Nothing. I I would say that that's, that, that also is, um, is bunk. And, and, you know, you do hear, you do see things like that on social media. I've seen that as well. Um, it, it, it may transiently, um, flip the needle, uh, real quick, but if you are in a low insulin state, it matters nothing. It matter, you're gonna, it matters zero. So you're going to go right back in um, very, very quickly. And I would make the case, all right, well, if you have, and again, this is something that is um, determined by the individual, so I can't, I'm not going to make a generalization, but you can make the case that every time you have a protein-laden um, meal, you're transiently going to flip out and then go right back out in. Out of ketosis who, first. Who cares? Yep. It matters nothing. It matters nothing. Um, you're still living in that low insulin state. You're still going to be um, in a very, very aggressive um, uh, lipolytic state by virtue of that. And if you have a little bit of a, of a wiggle. And it matters zero on your weight loss progress. Zero. Matter of fact, I'd even go as far as taking a stance saying that if I were to take a product like this or any other with an exogenous source of BHB that I could never, ever be in ketosis that as long as I'm right on that edge and that I'm burning fat as a source of fuel, that it will never ever matter whether I'm in ketosis and that taking an exogenous source of BHB is going to give me some of those benefits, fuel my brain, give me that, you know, little, little more clear headed, give me my brain that sort right. And I don't have to worry as much about being in the super strict managing this key to, or this, you know, ketosis all the time. You don't. It's not you know, as important as people make it out to be. Take a look at, if you look at my patients, I mean, you'll see the results that are just striking. And my guess is that none of them are in ketosis. Right. You don't have to be in ketosis. You just have to live in a low insulin state. I always tell my patients, and again, this was a couple of times today, 
we are trying to construct a plan or a protocol for you, not for you to suffer for eight weeks and then say, oh, wow, I lost all this body fat. Yeah, but you also probably lost some muscle. Um, we are trying to construct a plan for you that you can use forever. Forever. Sustainable. You're, yeah, it's sustainable. And you can live and you can be, depending upon you know, how, your, your size um, or how aggressive you want to be as far as your leanness, mm -hmm. um, if you will. You know, you can live at 50 grams, 100 grams a day. That's that's where we eat, and we do just fine. We're we're nice and lean. I'm single digit body fat, you know, body fat like you. I'm not as big, but I mean, okay. And I and I I don't I don't suffer. I have 50 grams. I have 75 grams. And who cares if I'm in keto? So so we'll talk about that. Let me make a note about that because I want to come back to that specifically. To I think it it's really it's relevant to what your goals are. So related to, especially with fitness going into the gym. So we'll talk about carbs here in a minute. Uh, you know, when you should take them, what kind of carbs actually let's, let's jump into that right now. So we talked about the types of fats. So let's, we talked about insulin response to different types of carbs. So let's talk about the right kind of carbs and the wrong kind of carbs here. We're aggressive. So I'm talking here in my clinic, we're aggressive, a low glycemic index carbohydrate. Okay. Just like uh, you know, has, has, has a criteria to it, just like, um, a traditional ketogenic diet, 5% of your, of your daily, um, calories are from, are from fats. Well, low glycemic index carbohydrates are classically defined as those with a glycemic index of 55. In my clinic, we're more aggressive. My cutoff is 40. My high end is 40. So, so give me, give me an example okay. of ones that fall into that, that category. Right. So those would be things like, um, most vegetables, okay, green leafy vegetables, um, I don't want you having things like peas and carrots because those are sort of on the higher end there. Still a lot of sugar there. Yeah, corn. We get rid of that. But pretty much I tell my patients, look, I want you getting all of your, distilled down, I want you getting all of your carbohydrates ultimately, and we transition them from 30 to 40 over two weeks, 20 to 30 over two weeks, and then zero to 20. Why? Because if I s shut the door on somebody and I take their line of, cocaine out of the refrigerator like that, my phone's going to be ringing off the hook because right. people are dependent upon the high glycemic index carbohydrates. So, so we, you're transitioning. We, we transition them slowly down. I want people zero to 20. And those are green leafy vegetables, uh, things like onions, uh, tomatoes. Um, what else is on the list? Scallion, celery. It's, um, and so ideally you would like out of the, in a modified ketogenic diet. So let's say instead of the 25 grams of carbs in a day on a traditional, you're broadening that to, let's say 40 grams within the day. You would ideally like to see all 40 grams. No, 40 glycemic index is, uh, is, is the high. No, no, no but I, th I, th I thought even on total carbohydrates for a day. In a, somewhere in, between 50 and hundred, depending upon how, okay, big 50 and 100. In, how big an individual is. And that's a good stalt. We so, don't, so out of that 50 to hundred throughout the day, you would ideally like to see them all fall, fall below 40 and ideally, on the glycemic index. And ideally even less than 20. Ultimately, after we transition them over, over so a period all, of all five of weeks. Yes. So if you're thinking, hey, I'm going to have to eat a lot on this diet, you're damn right. Right. I want you eating, despite the fact that the body is saying, eh, I'm sort of in a pseudo starve state, you push onward and you have to sort of force yourself to get those carbohydrates so, so, in. So a lot of fibrous carbs, yep. a lot of leafy greens. Yep. So now let's talk about, let's transition that right into variations of a keto diet. So let's say that it's someone, let's say it's a guy who's in his mid twenties to mid thirties, he goes to the gym five days a week. He wants to build muscle or he wants to maintain lean muscle. And he says, Hey, I don't want to follow a true ketogenic diet. I want to follow a modified ketogenic diet. I hear that I can consume carbohydrates around my workout for recovery. Also muscle size. Let's even talk about that. Let's pause just for a second. Right. Muscle size, knowing that a lot of cell volume is coming from fluid, which is coming from our body holding glycogen in the muscle. Mm -hmm. So you deplete the glycogen or yep. you deplete the carbs, yep. you deplete the glycogen, yep. you lose a lot of water weight. Yep. People see the initial weight loss, but for a guy who's trying to get a nice pump in the gym, he says, hey, I can't get that same kind of pump in the gym anymore. I want to be on a low carb or modified keto diet, but I hate losing the pump in the gym. What's my answer? We have that. I have that constantly here. You're going to look flatter. No question about it. Bodybuilders have the same problem. You know the deal. Okay. They ride that fine line. Um, 
where they're all glycogen depleted and then they're playing the games with the Oreos the night before. You know, we've all been there. Yeah, before right? they step on stage. Yeah. Yep. Okay, we know that we know that we know the deal. Um, but you are going to come in flat. You are going to have an issue with 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 getting a pump. And then my answer is, my usual answer is, um, is it about health or is you going to be a professional bodybuilder? Right. And then they don't have an answer for me, and I say, okay. So now that's now let's talk. So that's my usual answer in this clinic. It is not about aesthetics. I usually tell people that the look, people go, well, what about the cover of your book? I go, no, the look is a side effect of the health, period. You're not going to have that on a modified ketogenic. That said, you, you can, and this is the recommendation, James, you can stack carbohydrates, and I recommend this. We want, with those goals in mind, hey, I want to maintain some size, great. Use oral ketones, right? They have a muscle sparing effect. We know that. Right? It's a relative muscle sparing effect. You're going to shed some body, some muscle if you're on a, a classic ketogenic diet, trust me, which is why I use a modified ketogenic diet in addition to the fact it's more tolerable. I want people to have a little bit more of an insulin signal to maintain the muscle, to maintain the fat burning machine. A little bit. A little bit. But stack your carbohydrates before, even though I like when people train on a fast, before and after. And you'll so, have that nice pump if that's what you want. So, so let's talk about it. So this is... And just to clarify, this is a modified, modified keto diet. This is, let's call this a modified, you know, muscle building. You know, this okay. is a guy who wants to maintain sure. a pump in the gym, sure. but wants some of the weight loss benefits the rest of the day okay. of being in a low carb state. So now we talked about out of that 50 to 100 grams a day mm -hmm. of carbohydrates. Yeah. Obviously now this guy can time a lot of that, maybe take a lot of those centered around his workout. Which is what we recommend. But now... Is he going to go eat a salad? Is he going to just consume things below, you know, 20 on the glycemic index? Or for this particular person, is it okay to go ahead and bring in slightly higher, you know, carbs on the glycemic index? No. So maybe some grains, whether it's a rice or... So what does that look like? Yeah. And I usually tell them no. Yeah. That's my recommendation. What I will tell them is if they are living sort of on my protocol, which is less than 20, go to the 40 chart. We have charts. We have charts from 0 to 20, right. 20 to 30. Okay. And then 30 to 40. You want to do that? No problem. In the morning, we said, I want a high insulin signal at night, right? Mm -hmm. We want to have that really enhanced fat burning at night, right? At Low nighttime. insulin, yep. of course. So train in the morning, right? And you want to go to that 40? Then go to the 40, that 40 column. So give me yeah, an example. But I don't want you going and eating Skittles, which has historically <laughs> been what people do. It, it is. So give me an example of carbs that fall into that realm of 20 to 40 on the glycemic index. Okay. So carbs so, that this guy could consume yeah. in the morning centered around his workout. Right. So those would be the, um, the, the 40. So those would be, uh, I don't allow fruits. I'm just going to read off the list here. But there are some fruits in there. There are things like apples, apricots, some of the berries, so cranberries, um, we use, blueberries should be on here too, raspberries, strawberries, um, yams. What do some of the grains fall into that? So a lot of people who like, say, oatmeal or farro, where do those, those fall above that? I'm going to tell you. Those are you know, up in the, what, yeah. 80 range? Yeah, they're, you know, I think oatmeal is about 55, and I usually tell them, people go, I thought oatmeal was really good. No. I usually get, tell them no. Yeah. See, you, you see that with with, and I'm aggressive here. With me, I have to play the psychological games with them. I don't want their brain to be entrained to taste really anything sweet after they have finished that induction phase. So, when I mean, really, because yeah. that is what gets people continues to maintain that addiction, which is why I'm so aggressive at getting them down to zero to twenty. Just to recap, so. And I think this is a, an important point to make because there's a lot of confusion when it comes to people who want to go into the gym and they want to build muscle thinking, hey, a ketogenic diet is right for me. And that's where I say it's, it really depends on what your goal is. So if your goal is, like we said, you're this 28-year-old guy and you want to go into the gym and you want to get awesome pumps, a keto diet isn't necessarily right for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. It depends on what your goal is. And if your goal is aesthetics, Aesthetics, being big, full muscles, big pump, low carb diet, not for you. It's never good. Right. Ever. It's never going to be conducive to building muscle. Ever. You are, by definition, you're catabolic. Right. Uh, by definition. Good? Are you going to, the people that are the keto people that say, oh, yeah, you can do that. You really can't. What you can do, see, it's illusory. What's happening is, is that you are 
generating a relatively muscle sparing ketogenic state and all you're doing is you're uncovering that muscle and so therefore you think that you've gotten bigger but you haven't so what is a reasonable state so for someone out there trying to decide okay is keto right for me is it not right for me i like going to the gym again that person who goes five days a week wants to maintain lean muscle wants to be leaner but also wants to be healthier wants the health benefits okay. as well what can a person expect when it comes to lean muscle or the let's call it just the aesthetic component okay i know i'm going to be healthier i know i'm going to train my body to burn fat as a source of fuel but what am i going to look like can i maintain a certain amount of lean muscle like what is a reasonable expectation the only time i've ever recommended a classic ketogenic diet is for somebody that is truly obese right and even those and i mean beyond morbidly obese like you know, they're obese, obesity type three or four or whatever it is way out. Okay. Well, you're talking about, I mean, they're, you know, I had somebody here today, 50% body fat. 50%. So you're never, so, so you, except in this rare case, never recommending a full traditional keto diet. No. So all of them are modified. Yep. So now, so on one spectrum, you've got a group that's keeping their carbs on the lower side and also staying on the lower side of the glycemic index 20 and under so they're staying with the fibrous carbs and the leafy vegetables Correct. you got another group maybe a little more performance oriented and you're saying hey sure. we can go ahead maybe go to the higher end of that 100 grams a day and we do and we can get into that 20 to 40 range on the glycemic index exactly what we revolving do. around your workouts exactly so for that do. guy right there yep. or or female what is reasonable to expect as far as their look, the aesthetic component, because we're talking about health, but what is reasonable when it comes to the way you look and the way in performance too? So let's say someone who's a, a CrossFitter, for example, you know, they're not just doing it just to see how many reps they can do. Of course, they want to look a certain way. So what is reasonable to expect? Because by nature, it is very catabolic, a, a low carb diet. So we're all, you know, trained to think, hey, catabolic is this nasty, bad word in the world of working out. So what is reasonable to expect then in a ketogenic diet or a modified ketogenic diet when it comes to the way you look and the way you perform? Is this a results-based question? In other words, any year, expect to lose X. Is that what you mean? In no, other words, no but... I think it's more of, you know, what's reasonable to expect as far as you know that you're not going to get these big, crazy pumps in the gym right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to have this huge, you know, the same amount of cell volume that a bodybuilder would that's consuming. And I, I'm generalizing when I say bodybuilder. I'm even talking about a guy who goes into the gym who, you know, wants to lift big and be big. So he's consuming a lot of carbohydrates. So his muscles are nice and full. So without that glucose, what is reasonable? Like, what is that look? Because we know that we can, we end up looking a little deflated when, you know, our, our glycogen stores are low and they're going to be low. They're always going to be low. Correct. Like once we get to this certain point and they're depleted, they're depleted as long as we s keep our diet that way. Correct. So we never really regain that same kind of fullness. So I guess for the people out there, they're trying to evaluate and say, okay, well, how much of the health is important to me? How much is the aesthetics important to me? Like what is, what's the maximum end of that range? Like how good can I look in a ketogenic diet? A ketogenic, a, a traditional? Well, a modified. Right. So the, I will tell you, and we have some trickery that we use here in the clinic. So we use medical technology in order to be able to um, assist in that process. Some metabolic enhancers, things, medications that drive your your um, insulin signal low. While at the same time, um, we use uh, hormonal optimization to keep the androgen receptors stimulated, not in the super physiologic range, but in the physiologic range. So keep your, as an example, your free testosterone for males and females sort of right in 75th percentile or, or, or even from 75th to the 90, 99th percentile. So we can use some of this metabolic trickery in order to not only grant you your health, but also help you from an aesthetic standpoint, maintain the muscle um, on your body. So, but so it's, it's all, all about about at base level this is all about health and, and you and i've discussed this a lot and, and i've been i've told you flat out that's why i've never gone to like a full-blown all the time low carb diet that's why i've always gone through cycling where three days of low carb three days of higher carb trying to split the difference and find that happy medium right. where i could still have that same performance in the gym because you know the high intensity training it is a whole lot different training that way with carbs, with glucose sure. versus without. Sure. Also the pump. I love chasing the sure. pump. 
Uh, I'd never outgrown that so right. far. I'm sure at some point in my life, I probably won't care anymore. Still like it. There's nothing more satisfying, right? <laughs> right? Going in the gym, sure. training arms, getting sure. a big pump. So, but I'm glad you brought this up. So, because there's a lot of people out there who look great, right? They look like a bodybuilder or a smaller version of it. You see them on Instagram, they're ripped up, got a ton of muscle and they're like, Hey, I'm on a straight ketogenic diet. And people are like, well, Hey, look at him. He's on a ketogenic <laughs> diet. He's doing it. And so I'm glad you brought it up. So let's talk candidly about that. The people who are maintaining that kind of lean muscle on a ketogenic diet, we know that they're, they're supplementing their diet with anabolics. Yeah, I was saying, they're on something else. Yeah, they're on something else. Sure, um, it works great. And we use that trickery in my clinic, except we don't use synthetic hormones. We're not playing all the games, not buying stuff from the locker rooms. We are taking people who have suboptimal levels of, say, testosterone. You're doing the push-pull. So you're driving the androgen receptor okay, with some testosterone, right? But at the same time, this is what these guys are doing, except they're not telling you because they don't have doctors. And at the same time, we're driving insulin levels low, either on a traditional ketogenic diet or a modified ketogenic diet. So you're burning fat preferentially, but you're also maintaining and building muscle because you are stimulating that androgen receptor. Right. It's the perfect storm. Right. How, do, how does it, it works? And it works just like that. So we have guys that come back to my clinic, and this is not about bodybuilding. We look at their anthropometry, and typically in my clinic, we can get a guy, doesn't matter how old, 50, 55, in a year, they'll put on 10 pounds of muscle, and they'll lose 7, 8, 9, 10% body fat. I have guys here that are, that are in their mid-50s who are single-digit body fat, and they're stronger than they've been in years because you're doing that push-pull game. That's the ideal, but to somebody that doesn't have, that is not being cared for by a doctor, to be able to do that, right, to be able to do that is going to be difficult, if not impossible unless you're doing something cyclical like you're talking about where you're anabolic and then catabolic which is the game that bodybuilders have played for years carb cycling yeah Yeah. so yeah because carbohydrates i mean look you you know carbohydrates very anabolic yeah yeah so moving on the last category you want to talk about is keto for endurance athletes so there's been this idea that used to be endurance athletes would carb load for days and days and days you know try to maximize the amount of glute or glycogen that their body could store in order to perform as optimally as they could right but we know that our body can only hold so much glycogen one in our muscle and in our liver and I think that what we've seen over time here is people moving over saying, hey, if I can teach my body how to burn fat as a source of fuel, that that's a much better state to be in for endurance than relying on glucose. Now, I've read some some studies that say that even in an endurance situation, their body still needs a certain amount of glucose. So what's happening there? So let's say that I go do a triathlon and I'm in a fully ketogenic adapted state. So I'm burning fat as a source of fuel. So I go out there and I do this event. I bike, I run, I swim. Where does glucose come into play there? And, and how does that factor into getting into a catabolic state because when i hear glucose even in endurance i'm saying okay well if my body's trying to preferentially burn fat as an energy source i don't have any glycogen as that secondary source or actually primary source so that means that one my body's going to break down potentially muscle as a source of fuel unless i supplement it with some sort of aminos or protein which should so it's going to try to supplement my body through you know breaking down muscle or the other, obviously, is ketones. But ketones, how effective really are ketones in powering your body in an endurance event? Because I know that you can fuel your brain from it. Your your muscles can operate from ketones. But how effective is your body at creating enough ketones in your body to actually fuel your body? Not really, right? Uh, you know, using using ketones is using um, is essentially using body fat because the, the the breakdown product of of, uh, of fats, which ultimately get transported into the um, into the into the mitochondria is acetyl CoA, and acetyl CoA um, is a ketone is just two acetyl CoA molecules. So you're fine, you know, being fully ketogenic and and running marathons, and it's not going to be a problem at all, at so, all, it, it, at all, because that that is what ultimately you're you are relying on oxidative phosphorylation, the, and the end product of oxidative phosphorylation is these acetyl CoA molecules, which is a ketone is just 
two acetyl CoA molecules put together. So do you think is in that situation? So even if you're an endurance athlete, you're in a low carb state, you're using fat as a source of fuel, is there some sort of supplements that you should be taking to, to offset some of the muscle breakdown? Well, it would be, it would be this. Okay, there's, there's no question about it. So um, a beta hydroxybutyrate uh, supplement, which, which again, these ketones, whether they're nutritionally derived or whether they're derived from exogenous sources are muscle sparing. Muscle sparing. So I would definitely um, uh, be using that. Um, and obviously what you want to be doing, and I tell patients because they say, well, I have a triathlon, what, what should I eat? Don't eat any carbohydrates. Okay, I'm going to tell you when to eat the carbohydrates. I want you eating fats the night before. Make sure you're, you are fully loaded on fats, okay? So you're getting your daily macros. Um, and then what you should be doing in the one time that you should be um, using um, your, I mean, it has to do with energy systems. So when you are at steady state, okay, you are burning fat. Acetyl-CoA molecules are being shuttled into the, mito, into the mitochondria, okay? And you're doing your usual dance here and you're making ATP. That's how it works, whether those are from ketones or whether th those are from uh, 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 free fatty acids, all right? Um, it doesn't matter, okay? It's the same end product. The energy system involved when you are doing these types of endurance races is a, uh, you are re relying on oxidative phosphorylation. However, when you are doing your sprints, and this may be a missed triathlon. So if you're sprinting on a bike for three minutes and then you're stopping and you're slowing down to that steady state and using that fat again, as opposed to being glycolytic when you're anaerobic. In other words, you're getting that burn when you're pedaling the bike and you're burning. What are you using for, what's your energy source? Glucose, this yeah. is anaerobic glycolysis. But when you are steady state and when you are going and you're on your 60 miles, 61 miles, 62, 63, and you're just cruising along at your 30 or 35 miles an hour. What are you predominantly burning? Your legs aren't, you're burning fat. Okay, so you can supplement with, 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 with ketones, but during the times when you are going to be anaerobic, during the last 500 meters, during the last mile. Yeah, and that's what I always tell my patients. Have this before, have this during, and then right before you are finishing that race or amidst when you say, all right, you know what? For the next six miles, I'm going to be going and I'm going to be anaerobic. What are you doing? You're squirting the gels into your mouth. Yep. Be smart, right? Yeah, you can get it from your muscle. Okay, here's the, here's the other thing that people always say. I don't understand. Uh, you know, I'm fully glycogen depleted and my muscles are burning. I mean, my muscles are flat. How is it that I, my muscles can burn? Why is that? Well, because you never are going to deplete, never are you going to deplete your muscle glycogen. You're not. You're you always can't. You, you can't. Okay. You're always going to have glycogen Some. store correct, which is why people are on ketogenic diets. So you can't get a pump, but can you get a burn in your muscles? Yes or no? Of course, of course you can, right? So people don't understand that. So, but I would tell you that instead of doing that, right, get that fast surge of glucose into your muscles, okay, by just squeezing those gels into your mouth. So this was awesome. Actually, uh, this was a great conversation. I want to do this again. We'll sit down again, and that's what I'd like to dive into is more specifics of, you know, different types of training regimens based on someone, someone's goal. So maybe for the endurance athlete, here, here's, here's some tips on how to make a low-carb diet work for you in an endurance situation. Here's how you would make it work, maybe a modified version for someone who is in the gym, still wants to maintain lean muscle, and maybe someone whose primary focus is losing weight. And we can talk about some more details, but this has been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate you having us up Thank here. You. I love diving into this and I love kind of dispelling some of the myths because there's a lot of bad information out there and a lot of people are confused because they're hearing, you know, contradictory information. So this was uh, super helpful. Love diving into the details. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Cool, man. Cool. See you.